Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 770. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 11th, 2022. Welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down and find a row of cans and talk about the politics, the church, and any news item we find interesting. And for some reason, you guys like to watch that, and we, we appreciate that. From time to time, you may disagree with what we say. Go to the comments section on YouTube and put your disagreement there. You may like what we say. Please click the like button. And then go to the comment section and tell us what you, you liked about the program. If you're not subscribed yet, please subscribe. If by chance you like us a really lot and you're brave enough to share us with your friends, please share this episode with friends, family, and foe. George, how are you doing this week? I am on the top of the world, Kevin. Uh, it's been an uh, exciting week politically in the United States and around the world. But at the same time, I mean, but then there are other weeks, but... I've just seen God at work in my life and in the congregation ways this week that are just astounding. And before the start of the show, folks, we pray and we talk. And one of the things uh, we discussed was, am I now only seeing God at work? And in other words, I've been blind all this time, or is God sort of picking up the pace? And I really think I'm now able to see God at work in all these wonderful ways that, that I just was blind to before. It's just extraordinary. Well, I think that's what COVID allowed us a lot of things, and let's relearn church, relearn what's important to church, and relearn the locality of church, how uh, all churches, <laughs> they say all politics is local, all church is local. And we now have to re-engage our congregations and parishioners in a different way, because now we're doing it on video, now we have them coming into our pew, slowly coming back to our pews, and we want to let them know what's important about parish life. You know why? Because we forgot what was important about parish life. You know, as leaders of the church, we completely forgot. And COVID has allowed us to re-remember, oh, you know, fellowship, that, that's pretty damn important. Encouragement of one another called for in Hebrews. That's important, George. Well, let, let me just, you know, some little things that, uh, uh, one of the things they don't teach you in seminary is a uh, handyman job because about a good priest spends a lot of time unblocking toilets. This morning, I unblocked a toilet and replaced a bloke in the toilet seat in the ladies' room. Mm -hmm. Well, last, last week, I was at a parishioner's house uh, replacing the dryer element on their dryer. The little old lady who, uh, got a quote of like $500 for a new dryer and all I needed to do was but an $8 part. And I'm putting it in and her kitchen floor is rotting and needs to be replaced. And uh, we had the, the, the men's crew go over and look at it and, and they called the local flooring company to get the raw materials and the raw material and the guy came out, the owner, and he looked around, he quoted a price and he said, now is the church gonna pay for it? And the, and the men's club said, yes. He said, well, then I'll just donate it and I'll install it for free. Um, just, you know, this wasn't something we were thinking, you know, asking for. But yeah. here's out of the spont out of the spontaneous goodness of Michael's Flooring on Norval Bryant Highway, uh, the owner is redoing the floor of a little old lady. Yeah. So now she's got a working dryer, and this week she has a brand new kitchen floor. But you know, God. Is, but I guess what I'm we're going is that God. I've been blind so often to God working in these ways and not seeing his hand in all these things. Instead, I drive past the lotto sign. It's $2 billion. And I say, God, as I approach the counter <laughs> at Publix, I want you to go to seven, seven yes. <laughs> Well, that's not been happening. Nope. But people are being healed. Lives are changing. Mm -hmm. Hearts are being filled with joy. So, man... As I've said before, there is no better life than mine. You guys need <laughs> need to know that. Being a parish priest is the best way to live. Being called to be a parish priest is the best way to live, absolutely. You know, to, to seek and find God's calling in that and make it a vocation. You know, we've forgotten so much about what vocation means. 
uh, as a people. And it's, it's nice to see that, that foot post COVID slowly coming back to understand that. We attended a church for a couple weeks down in Tampa. Uh, it's a new plant, a new startup. And uh, a couple after attending the church for a while uh, said, hey, we want to donate a building to you. Here's the budgeted amount go find a building for that much and you can buy a church. And this church, a brand new church, uh, hasn't been around that long, now has a building that they're moving into. It, it, granted, it's a used one, it's a fixer-upper opportunity, but, you know, that's God working. Have them get on the highway and drive about an hour and a half north, <laughs> north. and pray for an education <laughs> building for Ooh, me up here. Yes. <laughs> who knows? I mean, Florida, there, there are people who, who retire here and have uh, more disposable income than you find in, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So uh, it, it's nice to hear these things happen in churches around the world. Uh, George, it's Veterans Day. We're in Florida. A lot of veterans come here to retire. I'm at the Florida Grand. We're probably 35 to 40 percent of the um, people here have served in the military at one time or the other. And we attended uh, Veterans Day this morning. What a great way to honor the people who protected this country. Uh, I think one veteran is worth 10,000 politicians. You know, it, it, when I started in this business uh, of the ministry, basically, oh, 90 percent of the men were veterans. Yeah. Um, uh, because majority of people going to church have always been 60 to 80 in Florida. We just get new 60 and 80 year olds. But when I started 30 years ago, almost everybody served World War II, either as, as a soldier or many of the women were volunteers or worked. There's one woman who worked as a bomb site, a, a, a bomb, uh, a Norden bomb site inspector wow. in the factory in World War II. Uh, the last job she had, because she got married when her husband came, when her man came home from the war now we only have one more one world war ii veteran left yeah. uh that generation is for all intents and purposes i remember when we had a world war one veteran now they've been gone for a long time now the world war ii generation is passing away before our eyes and the old folks now served in uh, vietnam mm -hmm. it's 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 amazing how yeah. life goes forward we have a, a couple of Korean uh, war veterans here too. But, you know, we mentioned this when uh, Queen Elizabeth died, that that greatest generation represented by Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Queen Elizabeth, and the World War II generation has passed on. Mm -hmm. You know, we're now left to uh, carry on certainly the, the freedoms they fought for, but in a, a completely different context. They weren't dealing with woke. They weren't dealing with the... Uh, uh, the the virulent atheism that that we're dealing with now in culture. Yeah. Do you think one day, Kevin, they're going to look back fondly at the TikTok generation <laughs> as uh, <laughs> the best know. and brightest of America? Well, they're going to look back and say, whose decision was it to make anybody under thirty five on YouTube an influencer? That's that's where we went wrong. <laughs> Okay, oh. that that's going to be one of the problems. You know, we went from the greatest generation to generation zero in uh, sixty years for sure. Um, let's move on. Oh, George, just, and uh, sorry for our international audience. Let's quickly talk about U.S. politics. We had our uh, midterm elections here in America. Now, midterm elections are happens. We have presidential elections every four years. The midterms are uh, two years after that. And this is a midterm election where you kind of, you know, judge the success of your president on midterm elections. The most famous midterm blow up was Bill Clinton, who lost 103 uh, seats in Congress um, in 1993. This was kind of a save if you're a Democrat. Like, Hey, we thought we could get blown out because for all intents and purposes, Joe Biden is a horrible president. Um, but I think uh, the fall or the overthrow of Roe v. Wade saved uh, Joe Biden, George. I don't know enough, Kevin, mm -hmm. to offer an intelligent opinion. I can only say what I know locally in Florida. Florida, it was a blowout. Mm -hmm. uh, the Republicans picked up four congressional seats. Uh, the governor and the senator, uh, uh, Ron DeSantis and Marco Rubio, won by double-digit rates. It's the first time since Reconstruction in the 1870s that every single statewide office is held by a Republican. Um, 
and Ron DeSantis was and Marco Rubio uh, neither you know Marco Rubio was lambasted on TV night after night by his Democratic challenger because Marco Rubio does not believe in allowing abortion in cases of incest and rape he believes that human life begins at conception and that's a moral principle of his and if the abortion if, if abortion were the issue uh, he should have gone down in flames but it didn't in Florida but in other parts of the country it did so I I I can't get my head around what happened because as you say Joe Biden is is not very competent but in some case some parts of the country it was a tremendous blowout and Ron DeSantis is very culturally conservative fiscally conservative mm -hmm. he's very personable he's a veteran he's a Yale man <laughs> yeah. uh, all the <laughs> Uh, all, all these. In other words, um, you can't. You can't. I'm having a hard time seeing a common theme. New York. The Republicans picked New York State, even though Lee Zeldin uh, lost to uh, Kathy Hochul. The Republicans picked up four congressional seats. They've picked up. They've broken the supermajority. The Democrats in the legislature, and the Republicans did the best since Nelson Rockefeller in the 70s. Well, so there's I some places that are sending running counter and then there are other places where the why didn't they win every single race from dog catcher to senator yeah and we're, we're a couple of days out uh we still don't know the results of arizona you know or nevada those, or nevada one of those unique things about american politics is politics is local and each state has a different way of counting their their ballots and arizona has a unique way of counting them for maybe an hour a day and then they take lunch i'm not sure you know they promised him sometime early next week was the latest promise as of yesterday we'll have to see what happens um and that's kind of an inconsistency for a populace that's so used to instant early results we live in 2022 george if i um, I'm too lazy to go cook a bag of popcorn in the microwave. I can go into Uber Eats or something else and order my noodles and have it sent to me the same day, same hour. Why the heck can't we get the votes counted in Arizona, George? Well, either I think it's deliberate. Um, people are playing games. Because hmm. in Florida, we had this problem after the 2000 election, if you remember, the hanging chads and uh, uh, Al Gore and George Bush. Hmm. And so the but the state government, successive governors tightened and cleaned up how we do voting so that for a state of 23 million people, we had the results within an hour or so after sure. the polls closed. Yeah. And from my little from my our rural counties, you're in you're in Sumter, aren't you? Yep, Sumter, Sumter County. County yeah. I'm in Citrus County uh, where you know, 90% of the votes went in one direction uh, to Miami and Orlando and uh, Tampa, where big metropolises, a lot of people, a lot of diversity, everything's counted. And nobody really doubts the honesty or integrity of the process. No, not here. Where you go to Arizona, you go to Pennsylvania, you go to other, these other states, it takes days and weeks. And then everybody is claiming foul and cheating because it's so, or Michigan, where, you know, this time around, uh, Governor Whitmer, who was a real COVID Nazi, uh, was, uh, you know, had all these dumps of ballots at midnight where, oh, we just counted 17,000 votes. And wouldn't you know it, 16,999 went for Whitmer and only one went for the challenger. That, you know, I don't know how it works and I'm not accusing fraud, but there's just a lack of transparency that gives trust to the system. And I agree. And, and I, there is voter fraud. No question about it. George Bush used to always say, I need to win by at least 2%. George W. would say that because there is an inherent fraud somewhere in the system in, in different uh, states. We don't know how it's being done. Uh, and fraud exists on both sides. Here in Florida, the only people arrested for voter fraud were Republicans. So, you know, I, I, we're not saying it's a single party issue. It just exists. Some people have figured out how to, to create fraud. And especially with COVID, that allowed for uh, unregulated ballot boxes put here and there to, to collect ballots. And fraud occurred there as well. I it, agree with you, Kevin, because yeah. I, I think it's in both parties' interests, Democrats and Republicans, to have 
you know, the people in Florida and both the Democrats and Republicans agreed 20 years ago, it's, no, it's not in our interest to have fraud or have these questions. So both parties agreed now the system works. 23 million people, it works. Pennsylvania, New York, Arizona, the parties haven't agreed. It's in both parties' interest to have a little bit of fraud and until they get serious. Uh, but now they, I got, don't, they got serious in the last election right after Trump was elected in Georgia. They completely revamped the laws. They had a record turnout, even though uh, they were guaranteed to have voter uh, suppression in Georgia. They had record turnout of all uh, people groups and had a solid election. Nobody nobody in, in Georgia right now is uh, screaming voter fraud because they cleaned up the system and it worked. So it, it can be done. It was done yeah. here in Florida as well. Well, again, I being down here in Florida, um, it's not a one-party state, far from it. Hmm. But the extraordinary thing is Miami has now gone Republican uh, for the first time since the 1920s. <laughs> Um, because what we're seeing is that Hispanics are entering the middle class in the United States and in Hispanic majority counties like Miami-Dade County or Osceola County to the south of Orlando, um, the new Americans are basically becoming like the old Americans. Absolutely. Uh, there's the, uh, the melting pot is working in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, there are parts of the country where uh, the sort of state policy is to basically have a toss salad that uh, you come here from uh, Lebanon and you can stay Lebanese in the United States and just, you know, have a driver's license. Whereas the mindset of, in the schools in Florida and the culture in Florida is that, you know, we're all Americans together. And now what that means is now we have uh, now we enjoy Mexican food. Uh, but we're not. Uh, but that's now part of our culture. In other words, where our culture grows in its welcome, rather than keeps narrowly redefining and redefining and redefining along race or color or or national origin backgrounds. Uh, I don't want to sound like Governor DeSantis and say Florida is the future, but look what's working and look what's, look where it's working and look where it's not working. Sure. Compare Florida to California, mm -hmm. and uh, or even to Texas. Um, and Texas is working, Florida is working, California isn't working. But just because Republicans were elected here doesn't mean uh, liberal states aren't working as well. There are Democratic-led states that have a good voting system. Um, but we're not just saying that, you know, because it's Republican. No, you know, it, no I, I'm, not, I'm not so much talking about voting now. I'm talking about the culture sure. of uh, culture mm -hmm. of welcoming people. Um, and basically forming a nation yeah. out of many one yep. um, because we've gone through a generation with wokeness where the uh, the mindset is uh, I can remember years and years ago where they wouldn't teach immigrant children English as their first language they would educate them in Spanish or whatever it was because we had to preserve their culture well these kids grow up they find they can't speak English they can't get real jobs and you know, they don't want to, the, the children who went through that woke beginning are now the ones who are insisting that their children be educated, learn English, learn something in school rather than uh, national uh, indignation about hints of the past, learn to read, learn to write, learn sure. to do math. Well, that's because woke um, made them a victim. They became victims of this progressive idea that you come here as a, uh, a Venezuelan, you can stay a Venezuelan. Well, no, it doesn't work. You can mean re our diversity is not our strength. <laughs> our diversity is our uniqueness. It's in our DNA, but no way is it our strength. It does not unify us. Yeah. So, all right, George, we need to move on. We've talked about that, uh, the, but I do want to say one thing. The last thing we'll talk about politics. I've been voting since 1984. This is the first time my uh, candidates won since 1984. 1984, I, I voted for Reagan in Wisconsin, and Reagan had a landslide that year. Uh, I've I've struck out with my candidates in Wisconsin and Connecticut. Uh, here, I ran the table, George. All my candidates won. That's a nice feeling. 
but that's the uniqueness we talked about here in Florida. George, let's move on to some other news. Uh, Follow-up, we did a story uh, last two weeks about the Bishop of Oxford. He put out a letter saying, hey, you know, this thing's coming out, it's coming to a head. We need to talk about really allowing same-sex marriages here in the Church of England. It's time. Come, can't you guys see the tea leaves? We got this living, love, and faith uh, report, not report, uh, uh, stuff coming out. It's time. And there's been some feedback, and we posted that feedback on Anglican Inc. And now we should talk about some of the more recent updates, George. Yes, the... It's interesting what's happening and what is not happening. Mm -hmm. Today, in addition to Stephen Croft, there are five serving bishops who have come out in favor of Croft's proposal. Three of the five are Croft's suffragans, people he appointed and elected and had had made bishop, so that's no surprise there. The other is John Inge, the Bishop of Worcester, and Inge's assistant, the Bishop of Dudley. So there are really two diocesans and four assistant or suffragan bishops, area bishops. There are a lot more bishops than that. Some bishops have gone on record saying, well, we're not going to speak until this process is over. I think it was the Bishop of Carlisle who gave that interview. Then there are some retired bishops like Paul Bays of Liverpool or Holtham of uh, Salisbury, 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 um, who said they would support it. But, you know, they're retired. It doesn't really matter what they say in the way the system works. So the groundswell is not rising. And the conservative reaction has been absent from the Anglo-Catholic side, fairly act. Now, individual Anglo-Catholics have spoken out, but I haven't seen anything from the society. Now, it could be that this is because the society has a gay bishop uh, yeah. and one who might be wink, wink, nod, nod. So, that's, so they're going to speak out on women, but they're not going to speak out on the gay issue because one of their own is gay. But the evangelicals have been pretty strong on this, both as organizations, uh, uh, Church of England Evangelical Council, diocesan, Oxford Diocesan Evangelical Fellowship. Those groups have spoken out strongly. And uh, there have been some really good work on these uh, point-by-point takedowns, or fisking, as they like used to say. Ian Paul on his... uh, P-S-E-P-H-I-Z-O. Uh, he should have the pronunci- sure looks- pronunciation under yeah. there for us, you know, yes. Yeah, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure he thought it was a clever title, but <laughs> man, okay. He has a very good takedown. We're essentially saying, what does Stephen Croft think he's doing? Huh? He screwed up the, uh, the process. He screwed up the biblical interpretation. He is offering a sociological response, and is opening the door for the total collapse of Christian ethics and morals by uh, adopting the Chinese restaurant. I'll take one from column A and one from column B approach. I do encourage you to look at that. Uh, we have it linked I'll, on. I'll put, put a link. I'll put a link in the show notes too. Um, other others have written about this. Uh, strong pushback on Roberts, the rector of St. Ebbs. Uh, he had a pre-publication copy because so that the day when Crofts came out, he could have a rejoinder. And we've talked to uh, we've talked to some uh, current bishops and some retired senior bishops who are I think the word I would use is livid with Croft. Now there was a bit of a noise initially where on Twitter Bishop Inge said that he'd been told to lay off by the LLF people people running the process told the bishops to keep their mouth shut. Then he reversed himself, saying, oh, no, no, we can see whatever we want. What I have been told by senior bishops and a senior retired bishop at the very tippy top is that, my God, what does Croft think he's doing? If this is, he's, he's opening the door to a third province and he's opening a door towards that will lead to the disestablishment of the Church of England. The uh, the the bishops are aware the Welby line is we need to keep kicking the can down the road. We need to keep all the balls up in the air because if we break into a gay church and a traditional church, 
then what's the point of establishment? Uh, why, you know, which, you know, do we have gay, but, you know, pro-gay and uh, seats reserved in the House of Lords and pro-traditional seats house, uh, seats reserved in the House of Lords? The Croft approach, it may be honest, it may be his sincere belief, but it is an attack on the Welby uh, mantra of unity, unity, unity to preserve the institution. Now, there are some conservative bishops who've told me, well, maybe the whole thing should fall down. Maybe this is the kick against the door that will bring the whole rotten building down. But there are others who are saying, oh, let's just keep kicking the can down the road. So the Croft thing is unsettling. It really is unsettling. Um, well, because it, it, it's unsettling because it's not... This goes beyond a first-tier issue in the church, or it is a first-tier issue. They dealt with women's orders uh, a little differently. There was an agreement that this is not a salvation issue uh, at some point between the, the two parties, and that there would be mutual flourishing, and that we can work together, we'll have a flying bishop, and trust trust us it'll work. It didn't, but... <laughs> <laughs> there was there was a, a bit of trust here. Right now, I don't think there is that trust between the two parties. I, I think now there's an understanding that um, they can't be trusted because they're changing the definitions, they're changing rules, they're changing how you uh, define same-sex marriage as we're going through this process. And, op and they're redefining marriage, which is... Uh, going to really open them up to what makes you unique as a church. You're no different than society. Um, why can't we have Baptists and Methodists and Lutherans and Catholics be in the House of Lords as well? Then, you know, and Muslim. And Muslims. Yeah. I didn't want to get there until we got to the coronation talk, but <laughs> the coronation oath. But so, you know, here's here's where you struggle. You've just made yourself not a church, and everybody knows it. Yeah. We talked a few weeks ago about what Justin Welby wants to accomplish before he retires in a few years. Mm -hmm. And his two big things on the horizon are the coronation and putting the taking the steering the church through the shoals of the gay issue. Mm -hmm. It looks like he's going to wreck the Church of England on both of those shoals. Because there's a press by the liberal elites to have uh, the coronation oath. Uh, that uh, Charles will take when he's made king to preserve and protect the established Protestant Reformed Episcopal Church, uh, Protestant Reformed Church of England. Right. Uh, there are laws dating back to the early 17th century that require this, and there's a push that the Church of it, that Welby is not pushing back on that we're aware of to have Charles be a protector of all faiths not just the the protestant church of england if that is the case gavin ashenden argues cogently that in uh in an item we printed on anglican inc that this will naturally lead to disestablishment because the liberal mindset is that all truth is relative all religions are basically personal private opinions therefore we can't privilege one over another therefore why shouldn't we have uh a, f a coronation oath that uh, affirms Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Methodists, Baptists, and so on, as well as the Church of England. And, and the Church of England has proven that they're not unique anymore. Right. And the problem will be that Welby, going along to keep everybody happy and have no direct attacks on the Church of England, will surrender the coronation oath issue which will then lead to disestablishment and if he surrenders to croft on the uh gay issue that will lead to disestablishment ben bradshaw an mp uh I, I believe he's gay but he certainly does advocate for change on the church of england's teaching on this asked a question in parliament of the church estates commissioner uh Silas, i forget his first name and will the Church of England, does it have any plans to revisit its exemptions from the Equalities Act? And the answer was no, we're not looking at this. Now, the Equalities Act exemptions allows the Church of England to say, no, we're not going to do gay marriage. We're not going to uh, I'll do this and that. 
and Bradshaw has been pushing for that to be revoked. Well, the political wheels will turn and Bradshaw is going to bring this back and forcing the Church of England to revoke its exemptions under the Equalities Act. So, Welby, by putting unity over truth, is creating a situation where with the coronation and with uh, allowing uh, mutual flourishing on the gay issue, uh, if you will, to use the mantras there, yeah. he's creating a scenario where the Church of England will, as an institution, a national established institution, will not survive. And when it does fall, what I believe will happen is what we saw in our report on the false church. Falls Church, last week we reported uh, Gene Robinson made a visit to the Falls Church building, uh, which has uh, the Episcopal congregation led by a gay man where they've done gay ordinations and they've gone all out onto that issue. Uh, it's losing quarter of a million a year, but they can afford it because they got all this money in the settlement with the Anglican Falls Church. The Anglican Falls Church has moved out. Year, a few years ago, has its own brand new building they built, is flourishing, planning new churches. I think Jeff Walton told me they're just starting and planning another uh, church. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, in all these suburbs of Washington, of which I have no knowledge, I can't tell you where they are. <laughs> the point is the evangelicals and the, uh, and I, I would say the, the Alpha churches will continue to thrive and grow and will be relieved of having to support the dying liberal churches and the dying liberal churches will live off of inherited money and that runs out pretty quickly falls quarter million dollars a year deficit that's ah, no problem when we got two and a half million bucks in the bank except when you hit year 11 uh when there's nothing else yeah no so all right let's move on i'm going to the next topic here george um you talked about coronation, disestablishment, the Renew Conference, and new leadership for the evangelicals in the Church of England. Now, yeah, I'll let you talk about that. I forgot to mention, aren't they Anglo-Catholics in our previous story? Just they kind of have the, uh, what's the policy Bill Clinton had uh, in the military? Don't ask, don't, don't ask, don't tell. It, isn't that their policy right now uh, in our last topic? But I forgot to mention that. And our new topic, leadership, evangelicals, George. Well, the Renew Conference, Renew is the sort of umbrella organization now for the evangelical faction group within the Church of England. Came together of uh, all these different groups, Wor uh, Word and Spirit, uh, Church Society, mm -hmm. Reform, all these guys came together from Renew. R E capital N E W re new get it. Uh, well, William Taylor has been leading this for about 10 years and he's done a good job, but he's not been one who's brought the fight to the establishment. He is a peacetime leader. William Taylor stepping down. And some people say this is a consequence of the Fletcher Smythe era of the public school boys, and we of uh, sort of messing around and messing up the English evangelical elites and Taylor's falling on his sword and uh, stepping back so they're going to have new they're going to have a new leader and it'll be very telling who this new leader is I don't know who it'll be uh, but are they going to pick a Churchill or a Neville Chamberlain are they going to pick somebody who will be willing to fight on the beaches and or they'll be willing pick somebody who will seek appeasement yeah. so renews new leader whoever it will be will basically give us an indication of where the church of england will be going will it fight or will they just seek to go along to get along and just so long as i'm okay i'm not going to worry about what happens down the street no, i think it's important because uh, they've certainly been vocal uh especially uh coming into the uh llf days here so we'll see uh on to international news let's talk about persecution especially around the world in hong kong we're getting reports that uh china is and we reported this last week china's really come down on the chinese in china the christians of china and the underground church now we're getting reports from hong kong 
Hong Kong, Hong Kong, uh, that uh, the persecution is getting worse there, George? It's not as overt in Hong Kong and Macau as it is in the mainland, mm -hmm. where different provinces, the local party leadership, uh, in some parts, uh, you know, they're destroying churches, uh, demolishing churches, they're knocking down crosses, their uh, children may not worship in Christian churches. Mm -hmm. uh, the underground church or the uh, house church movement really is now moving back into house churches. We're getting reports from uh, various uh, Chinese Christian diaspora groups about the uh, continued crackdown, arrests of pastors, disappearance of pastors, um, arrest of lay leaders, uh, police raids on worship services. The bad old days of the 60s are coming back. Hong Kong is not there yet, but the pressure is mounting on the leaders of the denominations to kowtow to the party. Uh, the press right now is on the church schools. There's an extensive network of Catholic and Anglican and other church affiliated schools. The public schools in China, the state schools have introduced Chinese, basically state propaganda in their mm -hmm. curriculum. The Christian schools have not bought the farm yet. They've not gone whole hog into uh, teaching uh, Mao Zedong thought, she thought, all this and that. <laughs> and here's the thing. I have a tremendous amount of sympathy for the Archb Anglican Archbishop of Hong Kong. I pray for him fairly regularly. And it's because he's going through in a major, major way what I'm going through. If I keep my nose clean, I can do what I want in this church. We can win souls for Christ. We can evangelize our county. Things can, things are and will continue to be fantastic and wonderful. If I get on my soapbox and point out the sins of others and say on this, if I'm a little Martin Luther, out I go. We had, uh, we're going through the, we had the meet and greets for the Episcopal candidates for election in January. And I had a list of questions I wanted to ask about uh, uh, divorce, about homosexuality, about uh, uh, will you support those parishes who uh, work closely with pregnancy, crisis pregnancy sure. uh, centers? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you believe about de deliverance ministries? Um, I had all these questions in my mind to ask, and I drove the hour and a half to the site, and I couldn't get out of the car in the parking lot because I just had an overwhelming sense of go home. Don't, don't make a scene. Don't be an ass. Don't, don't get involved. And so I went home. My parishioners who went told me that it was a show, that there were no questions from the floor. There were some prescriptive questions that all the candidates get asked at every encounter. And it was a Miss America pageant where I want to not be nice to old people and end <laughs> nuclear war. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, in other words, the the hard questions, the questions, as what I did not go, so I cannot say this whether this is true or not. But I was told that the they the spirit was notably absent. It wasn't. Ab I'm not saying that the candidates are bad, but rather the process to ensure the process that my diocese has picked to ensure that it gets past the national church and has a bishop is sucking the life out of the process. So how can I say to the Archbishop of Hong Kong, you should stand firm against Chinese communist aggression, when I'm not willing to stand firm and make myself martyr to 815? But uh, here you wouldn't be jailed for it. You know, here you would stick your head up and you you would certainly feel some ramifications. But uh, over there, you stick your head up and uh, you're borderline martyred. And, you it, know, it, we we do have a different experience here. We're, right now, a lot of Christians keep their mouth shut and their heads down because they don't want to engage the woke culture. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that, that that's clergy, that's laity, that's bishops, that, and, and they're trying to pick the right time to fight. What mm -hmm. Because the onslaught of, of woke offers cancellation. 
if you don't agree with us, somehow the media has empowered us to cancel you. We don't understand it, but we're going to use it. So if you can be canceled, why raise your hand at every question to be answered? Pick your war and your battles carefully here. Um, very carefully. Yeah, and, and it's a conundrum for me. I mean, it really is a conundrum. Was this, was my, the only other time this happened to me was uh, recently was when I went to the big revival show that was being put on by Michael Curry. Mm -hmm. And I walked in and I walked out. Sure. Um, not because I wanted to make a scene far from it. I didn't make a scene, but just the spirit is not present in this place. Now, how do you remain faithful? In other words, my call is to serve a group of people, serve a place, serve people. You know, I, I have three new children in the congregation under the age of five, I mean, in one family. Dad goes on trial next month for car theft. He's guilty. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Don't know, uh, but he, 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 he's allegedly. <laughs> he, yeah, he it looked like, he yeah, looked with like our it. public defenders in Florida. <laughs> he's guilty. Okay. Yeah. Perry Mason is not his attorney. So essentially, these, ch but these children and their mother have found a community that welcomes them that will be surrogate family while the dad's away for four, five, six years. Mm -hmm that these children will be brought into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. They'll be, they'll eventually have 250 grandparents. They'll have somebody. In other words, do I give that up to make score points and say to bureaucrats, well, I don't like the way you do things because I'm smarter or better. I know. Or, am I, called, yeah, yeah. or, or, or am I called to do the work that Christ called me to do, which is to mm -hmm. pastor people, to catechize people, to celebrate the sacraments with people, to teach mm -hmm. people about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I'm loath to, I have no problem criticizing the Archbishop of Canterbury because he, this is in the stage where if he speaks, I think action could be done. Mm -hmm. It's too late in Hong Kong. It's much too late in Hong Kong. The, the, uh, state is going to do what it's going to do and the archbishop there the anglican and the catholic archbishops have to find a way to preserve the church and preserve the faith for the work it does with its people and continue to evangelize um so there you go Thank you. Fighting, i admit i'm a coward i admit i'm a coward and a hypocrite how's that kevin no no i but it, it's not you're picking your fights carefully that's different than being a coward uh, i do the same uh, if people have followed my Facebook over the uh, last two or three years, they're, they're like, Kevin, you're a lot less political on Facebook. Yeah. I, you know, it's a, most people on Facebook already agree with me. I don't have to be as political as I used to be. I used to be uh, a sardonic observationalist on Facebook and post some pretty uh, uh, you know, chilling pieces. I don't do that anymore. You know, it's more pictures of the RV, life and travels, uh, you know, a little sly comment here or there. But I didn't post that much about the election except for the follow-up, you know, uh, with Trump. But it's just not worth it anymore. It's not a battle that uh, I I can do better ba battles here on Anglican Unscripted than I could ever do on Facebook. You know, the, the influence here, it's beyond reason. And I don't understand it. God uses it, and I'll let him work out the details. The Episcopal Church, having won a property battle in South Carolina, decides that this property they bought is not going to be very useful to them and decide to sell it back to the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina. Hmm, George. Hmm. Kudos to Ruth Woodliffe Stanley, the Bishop of South Carolina, Episcopal Bishop. Mm -hmm. Uh she has decided at uh, Fort Mott, I forget the name of the church, but in Fort Mott, which is a little town, rural part of the state, mm -hmm. uh, its leadership at one point made the mistake of signing some document or doing something or other that put them when all the dust settled on the wrong side of the legal settlement. Whereas old St. Andrews and other churches were able to keep their property uh, because of uh, the way the documents read, Fort Mott couldn't. Right. Well, Ruth Woodliffe Stanley, the bishop, 
basically looked at what she was given, which was a building in the middle of nowhere, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. St. Matthew's, and would she be able to fill it with Episcopalians? No. And in her letter to the diocese, Ruth Woodliff Stanley said that um, it's a small community, close-knit, and we're not going to have Episcopalians flocking to this building. And the right thing to do is, in essence, to sell it to its current congregation. And I don't know what the price is. Um, some people are complaining, well, we're buying back stolen property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my trailer was stolen out of the parking lot here. Um, <laughs> if somebody knocked on my door and said, oh, 500 bucks, you can have it back, I'd pay it because a new one will cost me two to three thousand dollars. Price of business. Um, this is the stuff that uh, uh, Catherine Jefford Shorey forbade uh, uh, Peter Lee at Virginia to do. Remember the, how Matt Kennedy's church in Binghamton, New York, uh, they wanted to buy it, and the bishop there, what was his name, Skip Adams? Yeah. Uh, Skip Adams basically said, I'll see you in hell before I sell it. And he Absolutely. basically sold, he sold it to a Muslim group. Islamic over group. Uh, an, an Islamic group over allowing the ACNA. Well, the ACNA, the, the, actually, it worked out best for Matt because it got a nicer building from another That's church it. that was closing down. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the the, the next generation has basically doesn't want to fight the battles of Catherine Jeffrey Shorey anymore and David Beer, Booth Beers, the, her attorney. And they just want to get on with life and get on with doing the work of the church. We may disagree on some of the uh, major issues, but, yeah. we, so but issues. we agree that the we, we agree that the church is more than just a vehicle to fund the law education of lawyers' children, private schools, and new boats and cars yeah. for lawyers. But in here, yes, it's unfair. But in the last fifteen years, we discovered it could be a lot more unfair. Mm -hmm. This is less unfair than previous administrations in the Episcopal Church. And mm -hmm. kudos for the uh, working this out. I'm glad they did. Let's return to serving the kingdom. Okay, mm -hmm. but the great opportunity. Forgive, don't forget, move on. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things that uh, one of our viewers wrote to us on this issue, this last thing you touched on, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Forgive, forget. Don't forget. Uh, don't forget. Don't forget, and move on. Yeah. But one of the one of the let one of the part of the fallout of the past 25 years has been the lack of forgiveness mm -hmm. uh among both parties uh i mean i can remember going to gafcon meetings uh gafcon one gafcon two and uh, gafcon two because i was in the episcopal church uh one person said you have to leave because you're an episcopalian um, because that person's experience had been so difficult that they had in their heart an un unaddressed hatred for all things Episcopal. And the fact that I was happy and prospering the Episcopal Church, even though I was fully in agreement with him on the major life salvation issues, still I was the enemy. And that's true both directions. I know uh, people uh, in the Episcopal Church who just despise her name is Catherine, has hyphenated last name, <laughs> like that. the ACNA. Yeah. And how do we move forward out of this? How do we move as a united witness to Christ, even though we are so very different in what we believe? It's almost interfaith at times. But how do we move forward as a Christian people, putting into praxis God's call to love our neighbors, forgive our enemies, turn the other cheek? Uh, we'd, the whole legal thing has been so bad for the image of the church. Um, even though these are issues close to people's heart, uh, you know, we know they are Christians by the size of their retainer, um, <laughs> not by their love. Well, forgiveness is How do we go forward? forgiveness is difficult because we think when we have to forgive, that we have to say we were wrong. 
Mm-hmm. No, that's that's not part of forgiveness. We say when we forgive that we have to to forget what happened and not. No, no, you have to learn from that experience. You have to learn from what you went through during that. Forgiveness is on a whole different level. Well, why do we have to forgive? Because Christ forgave you first. Mm-hmm. Let, let's just stop there. And in doing so, you don't have a choice. You must forgive. There is no. Is it's not something that I want you to think about forgiving. I need you, no. Your only choice in these matters is to forgive, and so you have to look and seek out how can I forgive this person. Well, you have to understand you can forgive and still be hurt. That that hurt that that caused that that can still be there, but you're forgiving this person for a completely different reason. You're forgiving this person first for them and then for you. I, and, the, yeah. the, there are two examples of people who I think our viewers will know their names. Corey Ten Boom. Mm, she was sure. the, the Dutch woman who was arrested for hiding Jews. She, she and her sister and her father were sent to a concentration camp. Her father died in the men's camp. Her sister died in, I think it was Ravensbrook, where she was also in prison. And she survived, and after and she, she wrote a book, The Hiding Place, and she became a noted Christian speaker and evangelist. In the early 1960s, she was at a revival meeting in Munich, and in the front row was the SS officer, I think, who beat her sister to death. Mm-hmm. And you know, she's looking there. There are other speakers, and she sees this man. His face is seared on her heart, and then she asked herself. You know, if Christ can forgive, you know, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he calls me to forgive. I need to forgive this SS man. And he knew her and she knew him. And he had come to Christ and he had repented of his sins and he had gotten out of prison. He had, you know, they didn't serve very long. Most of the camp no, guards who were yeah. jailed five, six years. So he was already paid his price as a penalty to society. But she had to make that effort to forgive the SS man. Richard Wormbrand, who was the uh, Christian pastor in Romania who was jailed by the communists, he would not hate his interrogators who tortured him. And once, when communism fell, he met one of them in the street, and the man had come to Christ, partially by Richard Wormbrand's example of loving the man who, uh, loving in Christ, the man who was torturing him didn't mean that the torture was okay it didn't mean the ss man was oh that's okay you can kill as many people as you want and i'll say it's okay no rather that spiritual love and forgiveness is different from civil justice and we shouldn't confuse the two justice in the episcopal church property cases it's been unfair in most most times but does that mean we should carry over into the spiritual realm the energies that were in the real property realm sure and i and i think our one of that the viewers point was uh we need to stress the importance of not to the other person but to god not in other words get right with god and then have god guide our actions rather than trying to admit well maybe i i should have let them take the church and might as well take my car while you're at it well we've heard the axiom uh i believe help my unbelief i forgive help forgive give my unforgiveness you know father you make up the you have to make up that difference because i don't have to and there can the world around there's no existence of forgiveness without god in the quotient it Mm -hmm. can't exist because Forgiveness is something beyond human emotion, beyond human experience, beyond human reason. It takes us one step further. I am not going to hold you accountable for what you did to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, uh, you don't owe me anything. And um, that that's beyond reason. Uh, We we don't see a lot of examples outside of scripture of, of true forgiveness. Uh, and where that when you do forgive somebody and you allow God into that quotient, you're very surprised to find out years later how that affected that person. You know, but this they're, is they're, a re- they're not they're not bound by the chains 
of your unforgiveness. This is a real life issue because, you know, in the parish ministry, I know a number of women in my congregation who've been raped who have suffered spousal abuse. Mm -hmm. I know men who have uh, had terrible things happen to them. One who's now passed away was a prisoner of the Japanese mm -hmm. uh, during the war. Others have been treated badly in their work life. And uh, in every single case, repenting of the anger in their hearts has made them healthier, happier, stronger people doesn't mean forgetting that you were raped. It doesn't mean that it was okay for the Japanese to torture and execute prisoners. But to no longer hate the Japanese, to no longer hate that man who raped you, to no longer hate that man who destroyed your career by preferring somebody over you, frees you from the bonds of Satan and frees you from the, uh, from the continued victimization of the rapist. Uh, if, he, if he's still in your head 40 years later, he may not be physically raping you, but mentally he is. Sure. And it takes that forgiveness. And, mm -hmm. and that can only come through, I believe, through the power of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. well, you, you the believe Holy Spirit. It, it is the only way it comes. You know, uh, We've seen it tried secu you know, in secular uh, terms to some degree of success, but the ultimate success of forgiveness is showing uh, other people you know, we, we talk about Christ's love, but equal is Christ's forgiveness. You know, what I had to learn, what I had to learn in the Episcopal Church was, you know, not to hate Charles Benison, um, who did his very best to destroy my career, and my life early on, yeah, but it, to love him as. Yeah, well, it's sorry. you. You, you have, always have this story about your father, uh, yeah. uh, your stepfather, st standing up in service and calling him out. And, and when you say, I, I won't do that, well, your family has set a strong precedent and you don't have to do it anymore because you're a father. Well, uh, but you know, my point is that when I passed, I remember going to a Pennsylvania diocesan convention early on in the gay battles with my pa with the rector of my church, Dan mm -hmm. Sullivan, mm -hmm. priest who sponsored me for ordination. And Father Dan got up and uh, basically spoke against a motion about gay marriage or same-sex blessings and whatnot. And a gay man uh, who was a deputy to general convention got up and spat in his face and said, I have AIDS and I hope you get it too. Sure. This, uh, this is when we didn't know really how AIDS was passed. I mean, if you can remember the early days of COVID where you get it from, who knows how you got it. And Dan responded by wiping the spittle off his face and basically talking to me on the way home about we need to love these people Absolutely. and see them as God's children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was very angry with the Bishop of Pennsylvania. I had a job, I, I had graduated from seminary. I had a job lined up, uh, curate uh, on a, in a very nice New York City parish, nice social parish. And the bishop said, no, I'm not going to ordain you. And then uh, put me through all this grief. I went through a Calvin Robinson process eventually i worked it out but my life took a different course and if i held on to the hatred of uh, those who have stood in my way if you will or those who've not valued me as a priest or as a person i'd still be their prisoner if dan father dan hated the person who spat in his face and, tr and wanted him to catch aids dan who's now passed on would be a prisoner of the other fellow's hatred but if you allow God's love to cleanse you of that, doesn't mean it was okay for the guy to spit. Doesn't mean that Charles Benison was a model bishop. No, he wasn't. But it, forgiveness is that gift that Christ gives us that gets, sets us free from the sins and brokenness of other people in this world. Oh. And, and there's he, plenty of it in the church world. And I want to, you know, we'll, we'll close this out with the question: If you can't forgive, are you forgiven? It's a paradox. It is mm -hmm. a paradox. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 770 of Anglican Unscripted.